Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the panel, we've convinced ourselves that you saved the best to last. The reason I'm here is that two months ago at Swansea, at a conference there, from the floor I made the mistake of asking a question, and that question was, would wave and tidal power learn from the mistakes and the lessons from offshore wind? And as a result of that, I'm standing here today. So perhaps the first lesson is to keep my mouth shut. You know. um, Port of Marston, where I'm from, we actually had the first two offshore wind farms in UK waters. In 2003, we had the first one, which was North Oil. And for that particular project, every one, every nut and bolt, and every component came from Denmark. There'd only been one other offshore wind farm, and that was Horns Reef in Denmark, which was seven turbines. So that whole crew came to Mostyn to do North Oil. Since then, we've actually been involved in another six offshore wind farms, uh, totaling just over 300 turbines. But the problem was is that nobody really knew what to expect being the very first. And the people that were involved, they sort of knew what they were doing, but there was nobody on the ground who knew what they were doing. And we got almost nothing out of it as whales. In effect, as I say, every nut and bolt came from overseas. And even the people, well, we soon got rid of the T-boy. We replaced him. But there was no engineering, no fabrication. And in effect, we got the crumbs from the table. Now, bearing in mind that such a large project, 70 million quid, there should have been something going into the North Wales economy. So apart from the port dues and the services that we provided, the wider community got very, very little. So to me, that was a big disappointment. So I think the first lesson is that in future, if we're moving into wave and tidal, I think there should be a commitment that if devices are being installed in UK and Welsh waters, there should be a percentage of local content written in to the contracts. That would be one of the lessons that should have been learned by the regulators and the government at the time. In effect, we're now the world's largest wind farm uh, developments. And all we've got for it to date is two blade factories and a little bit of engineering here and there. So it doesn't seem as if we've learnt an awful lot in 15 years. So hopefully in the wave and tidal sector, you will learn that particular lesson. Lesson two is your offshore wind farm test site in the northeast was just two turbines. They really went into it feet first with North Hoyle. But you've got two in the wave and tidal, you've got two test sites that I understand here in Wales. Now, as far as I also understand, they're receiving significant public money. So we therefore need a firm commitment from the developers, from the people who are doing the testing, that when we do eventually get to full-scale production, that the UK will certainly get the installation and the fabrication at least for the devices that are going to be deployed again in UK waters, but hopefully for the exports as well. Again, let's not repeat the offshore wind farm mistake. And lesson three is full-scale production on the port installation site. We had the experience that when North Hoyle started, they first wanted 100 metres of berth and 500, sorry, five acres of land. Within a month, they wanted 200 metres of berth and 25 acres of land. So you have to really have a lot of spare space. And we also found out that things don't go quite to plan because we're out in a hostile environment in the sea. There are delays. 
weather delays particularly, there's technical delays, and things bunch up. Ships are still coming in with components, but nothing's going offshore. In a port, it's a huge infrastructure cost in order to be able to accommodate some of the very heavy pieces that you've got. So unless you've already got that modern infrastructure that can take quite heavy load bearings, we have 20 tonnes per square metre on our keys, unless you've got that, you're going to be in trouble because you won't be able to expand as the project gets delayed. With the cost of that key side that we have, it's, it's, a, it's a huge investment, but the construction phase is very, very short, or relatively short, and actually getting shorter as we go along. You can't justify such huge expenditure for short periods, and indeed you have to keep it vacant between projects, and sometimes, as we know, they can run into consenting difficulties and technical difficulties. So you could go two or three years when you've got a fallow site. The way we overcame that is we actually put a condition in that if a project was built from Mostyn, well, then we also got the 25-year O&M phase, and that works for us. Lesson four, I think, is the careful investment by the port operators and indeed by the other suppliers. We don't really want any surprises. The rate at which the offshore wind industry became efficient was phenomenal. It was almost unbelievable, the learning curve from project one to the learning curve of project seven. To give you an idea, on the first it would take three days at least for one turbine. On the last project, we were doing one every five and a half hours. Also, obsolescence. And a prime example, <coughs> pardon me, prime example would be people who invested in CTVs, crew transfer vessels. In 2003, they were quite modest craft, just for running a dozen people offshore. People went out and they bought fleets of them on 10-year mortgages. Within three years, those particular craft were obsolete. Their replacements were obsolete within a few years. We're now on our fifth generation of CTVs. So you can imagine the people who piled out, invested a lot of money over 10 years and found that after three years, the craft was no longer suitable. You could probably pick up a CTV first, second generation that probably cost in the order of £600,000. You get one for 30 or 40K these days. So it's a hard lesson to learn. We had one tenant, to give you an example, who was asked if he could supply a telehandler for working around the site. He went out and he bought 12. He still got them, and they haven't worked for four years. That was just people getting carried away that all of a sudden there was a bonanza on their doorstep. So the message is keep your feet on the ground and make sure that what you're going to invest has a lot of value going forward. And finally, what we found is we didn't learn the lessons from North Sea Oil. People who were around at the time will remember that initially there were a lot of small SMEs, one-man bands, and everybody got a crust. Now, if you look at North Sea, there's probably two big players where they've consolidated, rationalized, and the same very, very quickly has happened in offshore wind. Now we have probably five big companies, and the small guy has in fact been pushed out. So the developers, instead of just doing small jobs, they're now offering packages which are way beyond the means of the small operator. Firms, they really, the big firms now, really will push you to one side if it follows what we experience in offshore wind. So the message is, 
you'll either have to expand or you'll expire. And the rationalisation will be there. Because if you think about it, everything that we've heard here today all has one focus. It's to turn the shaft on a generator. And we heard that there's 150 various devices all through trying to do the same thing. And if you think about it, we've been turning shafts with wind and water since biblical times. It's not a great science. So of those 150 that we heard of, there's going to be tremendous rationalization. Eventually, they will distill down to probably half a dozen machines that people will want. So you really do have to be careful and make sure that you choose the winner because there's going to be an awful lot of losers. Thank you.